Welcome everyone, uh, wherever you are, and I'm very glad that you are here today with us for the next half hour, hour. My name is uh, Ingrid Salvesen, I'm a journalist, and here at the Human International Documentary Film Festival, we are very happy to have with us today Pankaj Mishra. He is an Indian writer, famous for his essays and books, critiquing and unpacking the international order that uh, was made by uh, primarily the US and Europe. And that can explain, according to him, the rise of uh, everyone from Donald Trump to uh, ISIS. And this conversation is uh, made in collaboration with the foundation Fritt Ur. Welcome, Pankaj Mishra. Thank you, Ingrid. So uh, we will get to your uh, critique of Western uh, liberalism and imperialism, of course, but uh, I wanted to start off by asking you uh, a question about the situation in your own country, India. Um, both because uh, we in Norway hear very little about what's going on in India in our mainstream media, even though we have a large Indian diaspora, but also because, as you have shown in your writing, what's happening in India has many parallels to what's happening in the US and Europe, and maybe even has some of its roots in what's been happening in the US and Europe. And, and right now, there is uh, what has been called the world's largest general strike in India. Farmers are protesting uh, proposed liberal liberalization of the agriculture sector. And you also have this uh, big rise in the Hindu nationalist movement that's been going on for, for a couple of years. And so I wanted to hear your views on how would you describe the situation in India now and, and also whether it can tell us something about you know, large globalized uh, trends. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, broadly speaking, the situation here is very grim. Um, you know, the prospects for civil liberties in, in particular are uh, extremely, extremely bleak. Uh, a lot of people have been put into prison, journalists, writers, uh, even people commenting on Facebook on, say, the issue of the farmer strikes or protests have been taken into custody. Um, obviously, this is against the background of more than six years now of uh, rule by a far-right political formation, a political movement that draws inspiration from European um, fascist movements of the 1920s and 30s, very explicit um, inspiration uh, from, from people like uh, Mussolini and Hitler. So I think uh, when we consider, when we look at India today, we're looking at a very broad sweep of history, not just Indian history, but also European history. And one reason why I and many others have consistently argued that we cannot look at events in India in isolation from everything else that is happening in the world today, uh, whether we're speaking of far-right consolidation, whether we're speaking of terrorism, uh, whether we're speaking of uh, economic inequality. And I think the last few years have shown um, how we cannot actually uh, look at these countries in isolation, that what happened in India in 2014 with the election of Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister, Prime Minister and uh, a, a large mandate given by the electorate to a far-right uh, political formation. Soon that political earthquake um, was then witnessed in other parts of the world, uh, most prominently in the United States, uh, also in, in, in parts of Europe. And many of the underlying causes uh, were the same, rising inequality, uh, politicians having failed to deliver on their promises of economic growth or greater equality, turning to the language of identity, civilization, racial ethnic supremacism, and finding many, many takers for uh, their particular rhetoric. So, you know, now, of course, uh, we can observe much more clearly the synergy between far right movements all around the world, the similarities in their rhetoric. You know, back, back, back when in 2014, when I was trying to write about this, I was mocked for trying to compare India with what was happening in Europe and America. Uh, I was mocked for trying to say that, look, uh, these people who are joining Islamic State, the young men, 
Uh, these are people that have been found historically in very different parts of the world, have very little to do with religion or a particular region or a particular culture. Uh, this is the kind of phenomena thrown up uh, wherever uh, there is a large reservoir of dis disaffection, wherever there are large numbers of young men who are being slowly radicalized. And now we see that happening in countries like the United States. So now we have a better understanding of uh, what white supremacist movements and militant Islamic movements have in common. And your two latest books, uh, Age of Anger and Bland Fanatics, really tries to explain what you're now getting into, you know, how how a culture and an economic and political system uh, made in the West has uh, created a lot of anger and feelings of powerlessness and, and deep inequality in, in different countries around the world. Um, and you were, you were uh, saying that uh, when you first published these thoughts, you were mocked for drawing comparisons. Um, but now there's gone a couple of years, and I, I was also wondering whether there's any thing that has uh, changed or something you would add to this uh, to this core of your analysis that you've been kind of uh, fronting for the last years in with Actually, recent I wouldn't developments. I not really want yeah. to add anything more to it because, you know, I, I, and I see no reason to revise that analysis either. I mean, I, the only thing I would add is um, I would say today that we need to pay greater attention to the ways in which our understanding of the world has been shaped by certain deeply ideological notions. You know, ideology is something we credit to the people we don't like. We, we, we credit them to the far right. We credit them to Islamic militants or terrorists. Uh, we never pause to examine uh, the ways in which uh, our own thinking is deeply ideological the thinking that goes into editorials in the New York Times or The Economist or The Financial Times, the so-called mainstream periodicals, mainstream magazines, how they themselves have a, an extremely ideological way of looking at the world, by which I mean that so much investment in these magazines and in general in Anglo-American or Euro-American ways of looking at the world so much invest in investment has been put in creating artificial oppositions, binaries, the West versus the East, the free world versus authoritarianism versus Islamic fundamentalism. And I think the reason why these oppositions were made in the first instance, I think you know, a lot of these oppositions actually emerged during the Cold War uh, when there was an antagonist. And it was, in, 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 a, in a certain way, important to define yourself as what you were not. And you were obviously not you know, a, a totalitarian regime or an anti-democratic regime. But I think what that kind of uh, self-presentation during the Cold War has resulted in is a kind of willful blindness about Europe's own past, uh, the past that consists of not only of fascism, that's very easy to invoke, but also of deep inequality, of terrorism, of people rushing to far-right movements and personalities. Uh, it also obscures the past of slavery and imperialism, of racial oppression. You know, today, young people in America are discovering this as though for the first time. And you have to ask, why was this kept a secret for such a long time? You know, young people are outraged, like, how can this happen? How can a, a, a young black guy be killed in broad daylight, and the, his 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 murderers, the perpetrators of that murder, uh, not just this particular incident, but in the past as well, very little has happened to them. Uh, there's very little justice for the victims of racial oppression. So when you start asking those questions, then you have to ask, well, you know, why is it that we have not been sufficiently educated in these historical facts, the facts of slavery, the facts of imperialism? So what I'm trying to say is that the whole endeavor to present the West, the white European and American West as, a, as custodians of civilization, as leaders of the free world, I think that has really resulted in a, in a, in a very partial picture of the world today, of the past, uh, of history. Um, and I think that actually has created 
a lot of confusion in people's minds. And, you know, one reason why when someone like me comes along and, and tries to say, look, you had terrorists in, in, in late 19th century Europe uh, and, and they were assassinating heads of state. They were blowing up bombs in, 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 in public places, attacking cafes, restaurants, uh, processions. Um, those terrorists travel all over the world. They were all often found in immigrant communities. Um, you know, this, is, this history is out all there. There's nothing unique or distinctive about terrorism that we've seen in, 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 in Europe and America in the last 15, 20 years. Yet, so much investment was made in the idea that it's Islam that produces this kind of terrorism. And so we should study Islam. We should try and bring moderation to Islam, to Islam, Muslim countries. Uh, this is just one example of the incredibly skewed, even incredibly stupid way of thinking about an issue like, 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 like terrorism. So, you know, as I said, people like us who were making uh, these arguments were mocked back then. Now, after four traumatic years of Donald Trump, of white supremacism, of, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of craziness that we used to, credit to Muslim countries or to Muslim young men erupting right in the heart of the modern West. I think people are much more chastened. Uh, they're much, much more careful in their analysis. So I see no reason to take back or to refine anything I've been saying in the past because, you know, so much of what I've been saying has been actually vindicated by uh, 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 recent events. And you see also that people are starting to question this more. I mean, we've had the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and also uh, demands of uh, decolonizing our, our current uh, understandings of the world or mainstream understandings in, in, in the West, as you were talking about now. And also in Norway, we had a big debate on decolonizing the curricula in the universities, for example. And I wondered if you can help us to kind of um, unpack or explain what decolonization means in this sense and, and why it is important? I think, you know, it's an unfortunate word because it has a particular connotation, which is of, you know, uh, it, it refers to the act of um, colonization. And, you know, there are countries where um, colonization or, or those countries were never major colonialist powers. So they are well entitled to ask, you know, what do we have to decolonize? I think, um, you know, a, a much more neutral word should probably be used for what is really wanted right now, which is that we have to revise our ideas. A great correction or a great revision is, is, is needed. And it's not just needed in Norway or Britain or United States or France, it is needed Practically in every country I can think of, it's very much needed in, in India, where uh, upper caste Hindus have created a vision of the world in which their dominance seems natural, a fact of nature, something that they are completely entitled to. Um, now, this is the case with ruling classes practically everywhere. You know, uh, in, in, in some cases, in some cases, they happen to be white. In some cases, they have to have, happen to have brown skin or they have black skin in, in, in many countries in, in, in Africa. The point is that every ruling class creates a vision of the world, creates an ideology that legitimizes its rule. It's very simple. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And it is challenged when enough people come up from below, whether a member of a particular group, such as women or members of ethnic racial minorities, who think that their role in these visions of the world is being slighted, ignored, or even mocked, um, in the, as in the case of you know, uh, 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 racist ideas about um, American uh, supremacy or superiority. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that is being challenged today, uh, unfortunately, very late by the Black Lives Matter. But anyway, you know, let's welcome this, that this, 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 sort of, this kind of discourse is now increasingly uh, embraced by uh, more and more sections of the establishment. But you do have to ask, you know, why did it take such a long time? It is because ruling classes, the establishment, uh, and by which I mean not just the political class, but also the intelligentsia, uh, people writing for newspapers, journalists, editors, 
people in universities devising educational syllabuses for not just for universities, but also for schools, you have a whole particular discourse which has legitimized the rule of specific groups in each of these societies. And today, that is being overwhelmingly challenged uh, in India by low caste Hindus, by Dalits who are challenging upper caste versions of the world, in, in, in America by African Americans who also want a place for themselves, not only in their society, but also in particular interpretations of the American past. Likewise, with ethnic racial minorities in a country like Britain, where they feel what they have learned at school and in university simply does not acknowledge the role Britain played in many of the countries they came from. And there were many, many cases forced to come from those countries to the United Kingdom because those countries have been left in such a miserable state by British imperialists. So I think uh, we are all kind of in the process of a, what I would like to call a great correction or a great revision. Uh, we can call it decolonizing the syllabus, um, but I think you know we should probably use a much more neutral phrase for, for, for what is you know eminently desirable at this point. I will take that with me uh, and revise my language as well. Um, but you are now talking about this, that this is also coming because there is a lot more challenge from uh, below. And, and in an interview uh, last year in The Guardian or a conversation um, with uh, Viet Tan Nguyen, you uh, said that um, free speech has never been freer. And you were arguing that uh, people who are now uh, complaining about cancel culture and that uh, uh, too much political correctness, they're just afraid of their own position, if I understood you correctly. Could you, could you elaborate a bit on, on, on that thought? No, that's, that's a very important point. And I think it flows uh, naturally and directly from the point I've just made that we are in the process of a great correction and a great revision. And obviously people who have enjoyed uninterrupted power for a long time, not just political power, financial power, but also cultural power, um, they feel deeply threatened. They deep, feel deeply threatened by the explosion of voices in the public sphere. The fact that uh, an African-American activist today can have a Twitter account on which he or she can challenge uh, the pieties of the white establishment uh, the fact that any person can today build up a large following on social media and challenge uh, the stuff that is being said by some of the most powerful people in journalism, in film, in media, and often, often uh, 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 actually, you know, enforce corrections in their worldviews, uh, often force people to acknowledge that they have been insulting, if not downright racist, in what they've said or in the way they have depicted certain minorities in their works of art, in, their, in, in particular films or documentaries. So I think uh, there's a lot of contention, obviously, out there. Uh, but I think we do have to acknowledge that actually many, many more people now have the right to speech than they did when the so-called legacy media was in the hands of the establishment and there were very clear rules about who can say what at what particular time you know i've spent all my life uh, i'm not on social media but i've spent all my life writing for the so-called legacy media for the so-called establishment media and i can give you many instances of the of, of the ways in which my work has been discreetly censored the ways in which I've often censored myself because I know that some things I want to say will not be published, will not be accepted by the primarily, in fact, overwhelmingly white editors and journalists uh, who are working uh, for these for these establishment magazines and, and, and newspapers. So I think the kind of constriction that I felt uh, working for these magazines is no longer felt by many, many people who want to say certain things about slavery or imperialism or about U.S. foreign policy, about economic policy, about the prominence of certain people in public life uh, who should have been retired a long time ago, who are just lingering on because they have cultural power, they're deeply networked within the establishment. All these challenges are erupting now from various quarters. And obviously, uh, the people 
feel people in, in positions of power today feel deeply threatened by this. And so they've created this bogey that they're being canceled, uh, that they are being deprived of the right to free speech, which is a total lie, because when you look at, even if you look at the, 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 the people who signed that particular letter uh, to Harper's Magazine, published in Harper's Magazine, if you go down uh, the list of people who signed that letter, not one of them has actually suffered um, cancellation, as they would call it. Uh, not one of them has been deprived of the right to speech. In fact, they have some of the most expensive platforms in the world today. Uh, they have access to practically every form of media, uh, the legacy media, social media. Some of these people have millions of followers. Uh, and there's never been the slightest suggestion that they would be or they are being deprived of their right to speech by people objecting to their ideas or people contesting their ideas. But as I said, I think people who are deeply accustomed to not being challenged at all, who are very accustomed to speaking uninterruptedly without any kind of challenge, obviously, when challenge arises, they're going to feel deeply paranoid something very vital, something very important, which is their right to be not challenged is being taken away from them. And that's why we see this kind of hysterical response, uh, this invocation of words like woke, cancel culture, political correctness. All people are asking for is let's have a debate, let's have a larger discussion about many of these issues, uh, whether it's transgenders or whether it's imperialism, uh, slavery, and, you know, as I say, people who are accustomed to having or, or listening to their own voices pontificate at length about these issues feel deeply threatened by the explosion of, of, of free speech. I mean, another aspect of, of these questions surrounding free speech is, um, is the rise of social media and alternative media. And as you are now talking about, you know, it's given voice to many voices that haven't had uh, any platform before that are important, but it's also given rise to uh, digital misinformation and, um, uh, and fake news, you know, these um, developments that are also, uh, can be dangerous. You've seen them uh, result into the storming of the US Congress or, or vigilant mobs in your own country. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, is this something that we just, is a, pay a, pr a price to pay or we are now talking a lot about how to regulate the platform companies, the internet to, to hinder this, but, uh, but what, uh, what is your take on, on, on this? Uh... Well, I mean, I think, you know, people have been writing right from the early 20th century onwards. Uh, I, I think Heidegger was the first uh, major philosopher to focus on this issue of technology and what technology does uh, in the, the ways in which human beings can become enslaved to uh, modes of technology that they think they can use wisely to control the world, to master the world, but they end up being controlled by that particular technology. And I think, you know, social media in many cases is just another uh, uh, technological fact that in a way has overwhelmed really our capacity to understand the world, master the world, and has become the source of disinformation. But, you know, again, I think the answer is not to ban social media. The answer is not to do away with this technology whatsoever, because it has also brought with it uh, several benefits. And, you know, again, I think it's, it's simply impossible to do away with it at this point. So I think, you know, then is the question of regulation. Uh, how do we um, basically prevent fake news from circulating in the way it does uh, and damaging democracies which need a degree of consensus, which need a, 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 you know, large numbers of people agreeing upon certain facts? Now, these are you know, questions deeply complicated. And I think, you know, in a way, because they have such a bearing on the, on the, on the health of our democracies, they need to be urgently discussed. But I think the argument that um, social media has become a menace to democracy and therefore we can basically address this problem by banning certain people like Twitter banning Donald Trump, 
which I think was really truly uh, extraordinary, and 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 I think you know uh, it just showed how much power had been invested in essentially, uh, if if you don't mind my saying this, you know, people drop out from universities who set up some kind of a outfit that suddenly became very famous, and now they are you know Silicon Valley billionaires, huge numbers of. Uh, uh, followers and and you know social media platforms that are followed by billions of people, but when you look at these people, like who appointed them? How did they gain so much power? So I think in a way we need to also tackle that before uh, complaining about you know the the critic of J.K. Rowling who is posing you know a legitimate question about uh, the transgender community, um, you know, the fact that Donald Trump himself emerged out of this world created by social media of disinformation. Now, how did that happen? How did social media acquire that kind of power in the first place? So I think um, these questions are important, but I think uh, the answer is not to unilaterally ban individuals or organizations. Uh, We need to have another discussion about that. It it makes me think of something I also wrote in in Age of Anger. You write that... um, to make the future less dark, uh, we need to reflect more deeply about our own participation in everyday violence, and uh, and but also our own insensitivity when witnessing others people's suffering. Um, and I mean, social media can be part of everyday violence, but there's also a lot of other examples. And um, and this conversation is set at the documentary film festival featuring documentaries from all over the world, uh, focusing on human rights issues. And so essentially it's uh, pretty much about the witnessing others people suffering through film, at least. Um, so, uh, I mean, what is your advice to the audience that is coming to this festival to how to handle this and to reflect on it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what has happened with social media, unfortunately, is that it has actually, um, in many ways, lessened our ability to empathize um, because I think it has it has fostered a competitive culture in which even when people are talking about specific atrocities or political problems, brand maintenance or brand promotion or self promotion still takes too much priority over political causes, over uh, uh, economic uh, disparities, uh, or or any cause that is being highlighted on social media. So I think um, what social media often does is aggravate the tendencies uh, that are inherent in a capitalist competitive culture, which are those of individualism. And, you know, I think if you subscribe to an individualist ideology fundamentally, you're already closing yourself off to the experiences of other people, to the suffering undergone by by other people, because you're basically in it for yourself. And you think of the world as essentially a jungle where everyone has to struggle in order to succeed. And also, most importantly, to undermine other competitors and rivals. So I think uh, these kinds of um, essentially competitive and, and, and sort of consumerist cultures have overwhelmed large parts of the social of, of social media. So I think our older experience of watching a film or reading a book and then extending empathy through that process to the victims of violence, to the victims of, 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 of suffering, that experience has been somewhat short-circuited. So I think in, in, in one sense, the older forms of media, whether it's reading or whether it's watching films, it's still the best way to connect to the experiences, to the fates of people we don't know, people we have never met, but with whom we are obviously very, very deeply, deeply connected. Also the space, you know, the time that we have, a one hour, or one and a half hour watching a film, uh, that is a time in which you are still, you're absorbing information, you're absorbing experiences. And instead of, you know, some way trying to project yourself out there, uh, you are in a more receptive mode instead of, you know, other directed mode. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, films, documentaries, 
um, reading books, both fiction and nonfiction, are, are, are still in many ways the, the modes that can get us closer to what other people around the world are thinking, what they're feeling, and you know, also what they're going through in their daily lives. While I'm uh, asking you for advice, here's another question for you, because uh, we are here in Oslo and, um, and I mean Scandinavia and the Nordics are usually internationally, you know, labeled as a socialist paradise or, or hell, depending on who you uh, talk to. But um, I mean, our welfare is also deeply embedded in, in this um, international Western order uh, that has made and unmade the world. And, and uh, I was wondering, where do you see any role of the Nordic countries to play? If we have any role, like what what, what should our countries and our governments and our people do in this mess? Well, I, I think Nordic countries, with their um, social welfare states, um, you know, today many people in America are invoking the Nordic states and say, okay, if we if we can't have socialism, at least we can have states that are responsive to the suffering of ordinary citizens, at least we can have states in which we can trust instead of the shambolic state that we've got, uh, which has you know, caused um, uh, indirectly at least the deaths of half a million Americans today. So, you know, I think um, Nordic countries with their particular social and political structures have a lot of lessons to offer to the rest of the world, you know, most importantly in how to construct, create a state that is deeply responsive to its citizens, that is simply not a mode of exerting power. Uh, right now, in, in, in much of the rest of the world, we are trapped in this binary between, and it's an artificial binary again, between democracy and authoritarianism. Um, what we really need to think again, and I think the pandemic has focused all our minds on this, on this question, it's like, all right, you know, let's not worry too much at this stage about democracy or authoritarianism. Let's think about, are these states capable of dealing with public health emergencies of the kind that we witnessed in the last year or so? Uh, are these states willing to help people who are unemployed, who lose their jobs? Uh, do they have the kind of capacity that they, that they need uh, to perform those tasks? How do we build those kinds of capacities? So I think you know, today, uh, uh, the experience of Nordic states of the last few decades is, is more important uh, than, 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 than ever before. And I think, you know, in, in, in the, the rest of the world could do very well to learn from the experiences of these, of these countries today. We should colonize all the other countries and force our system upon them. No, I'm just uh, joking. Of course not. <laughs> but... Um, in the end of Bland Fanatics, your latest bu book, you do write that, um, uh, quote, ethnic nationalism in India and criminally inept autocrats in Britain and America have bluntly clarified that liberal democracy is not what we have, at least not yet. Which made me curious to think, you know, uh, do you think that there actually can be real liberal democracy? And if so, what would it look like? What are we, what should we fight for or towards? Yeah, I think, you know, democracy is a promise of equality. Um, you know, it's not enough to have uh, elections every four or five years or so. We have them in India. We've had them pretty consistently over the last um, seven decades. But equality, democracy is still a remote goal. Uh, and we are nowhere near it. In fact, we've been pushed further away from it. Um, so I think if we think of democracy in terms of the equality and dignity of individuals, uh, then we are you know, beginning to understand really you know, how we can get there, what kind of economic system we should have, uh, what kind of taxation regimes we should have, uh, what kind of you know, models of economic growth that are environmentally sustainable we should have. Um, simply asserting that you've got democracy because the Soviet Union is communist or because China is authoritarian, uh, doesn't really get you anywhere. And, and, and in, in many ways, that is the rhetorical maneuver uh, many people in the West have been engaged in in the last uh, six or seven decades. 
simply asserting that we are democratic uh, because we have elections every year and so on and so forth, no matter you know half the population, half the electorate in America didn't even bother to vote uh, for much of these um, seven decades. Um, but you know the fact that you have these representatives, these congresses and state legislatures, so you can have the appearance of a formal democracy um, without at the same time realizing the fundamental uh, goals of, 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 of democracy. I, and I think, you know, uh, right now, many, many more people are actually aware, which is an unprecedented moment, really, uh, in our own lifetimes and in the lifetimes even of our parents. Um, many, many more people are aware that there is a huge gap between who we think we are and what we actually are, and that we need to narrow that gap. Uh, and so we need to struggle, we need to strive. And that in, that in itself is, is, is hugely important. It's an achievement, really, you know, it's something to build upon. Because as long as you sit there complacent, like many people in, uh, in an older generation did, is that democracy is something achieved, it's been realized. Uh, it only needs to be fine-tuned here and there. Um, you know, you end up with, with the situation, you ended up in places like uh, Britain and, and, and the United States. Um, whereas if you energize people uh, into thinking, actually, you know, there are goals and this is something that's driving Black Lives Matter, you know, that there are these goals of democracy in America that have not been realized and we are going to realize those goals. So you involve many, many more people, you energize, especially young people, you bring new energy into politics. And, you know, this becomes a way of being in the world. Uh, being engaged with it, as opposed to simply congratulating yourself that you've got it, you know, you've got it all. With those words, uh, I thank you so much for uh, uh, being with us today and uh, hopefully energizing more people and, uh, and um, helping people be more involved. Watching documentary films, as you say, is one way of doing that. Um, but also learning from people like you. So thank you so much for uh, sharing thank with us. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I very much wish I was there to watch the films. We know COVID will once uh, be over, we hope, at least. Um, but the, thank you for joining us and thank you to all of you who watched uh, today and you can read more of uh, Pankaj Mishra's uh, thoughts and reflections in his uh, books uh, that you will find with a short Google uh, search. Uh, he is uh, everywhere. So thank you so much.